It's time. You need to build a home server. And when you do, you will inevitably get to the point where you have to pick a motherboard. And that's when your build will fall apart. Picking almost everything else from the processor to the power supply, case, memory, and even the drives themselves is a pretty straightforward process because you can basically compare your options using generic benchmarks or requirements. But the motherboard, the motherboard is a problem. Now first, I have a few example builds in the description that you can model your home server off of, but you should at least learn why the motherboard is such a problem because you might have to switch some of these components out. The motherboard you select has to be compatible with the processor, but it also has to have the total number of SATA ports and NVMe drive slots that you'll need, the networking you'd like to use, or a PCIe slot that you can use for that functionality. But the PCIe slot might not have enough PCIe lanes based on the other cards you'll need. Or the slot you need could be totally disabled based on the fact that you added a device already which was assigned those PCIe lanes. What about the motherboard chipset? Why does a chipset add PCIe lanes? And do you even need those PCIe lanes? What is a PCIe lane? Do you need ECC memory? How much memory do you need? And at what speed will that memory run at if you actually fill all four DIMMs? If it has four DIMMs. Do you need PCIe bifurcation? Do you even know what PCIe bifurcation is? The reality is the motherboard you select is the most important part of your home server build. And you can go and buy the cheapest or most expensive option, but if it doesn't have the features and compatibility that you need, you'll be upgrading it in the future, or it won't have the expansion that you think it will have. So in this video, I wanna bring you through my thought process on home server builds to help you pick the right hardware for your home server. I've been obsessing over this for the better part of four to six weeks, and this thought process is what helped me pick the components that I'll be using in my home server build, which I'll have a video Video on soon, so get subscribed if you want to see that. We're going to take a look at the processor you should use, then how you can select a motherboard based on the processor and the actual functionality that you'll need, and then fill in the memory, drives, power supply, and case, which are easier to pick once the motherboard and processor are selected. Now, the processor isn't the hardest part to pick, but it also isn't the easiest. The first thing that you have to decide is the processor generation you'd like to use, and that is generally dependent on what you'll actually be using the device for. Older processors work well with home servers, mainly because things like hypervisors rely on cores and threads more than clock speed, and clock speed is normally what changes from generation to generation. So using AMD as an example, you'd be picking between Zen 3 and Zen 4, which is the AM4 and AM5 socket. There are a ton of really great Zen 3 processors which can generally be found on sale, and their price to performance will be really great for a home server but the type you should use will be dependent on what you actually need. Using a Proxmox hypervisor as an example build, something like an AMD Ryzen 9 5900X will give you a ton of performance since it has 12 cores and 24 threads, but it's probably way overkill for a NAS. It also has a higher TDP than you get with some of AMD's other processors. A higher TDP basically means more power consumption and more heat, which requires better cooling. Newer processors may have a lower TDP based on the exact processor you plan on using, but don't undersell this point because 30 watts additional at idle for a home server running 24 seven can end up costing you more in the long run from an energy consumption perspective than upgrading to a newer, more power efficient chip today. So it's not the most important point in the build, but it's something you should take into consideration and to complicate it even further, certain motherboards allow you to use a power efficiency mode, which will lower the total TDP of the processor. So, just another thing to look into on the motherboard side. The next point is integrated graphics. Some processors have integrated graphics and some don't. Using our Zen 3 and Zen 4 example, all Zen 4 processors have integrated graphics, but only certain Zen 3 processors do. So you'll need a GPU for the setup process at minimum. Then there are the PCIe lanes and how many total PCIe lanes each processor supports. PCIe lanes are basically used to connect your hardware together. Think of PCIe lanes as highways with cars acting as the data traveling to its destination. The building that the car is trying to get to is the component, so the CPU, GPU, etc. And the data gets there using PCIe lanes. We're gonna get more into this on the motherboard side, but every NVMe drive or PCIe device you plug into your motherboard will use PCIe lanes. 
Some processors offer more PCIe lanes than others, but it's generally from generation to generation rather than model to model, so don't go crazy with this point. There's not really a good or bad way of looking at all of this, but the way that I like to look at processors is cores and threads, TDP, then integrated graphics. I honestly don't even look at the PCIe lanes and just try and work with what the processor I select has, but I'm not necessarily suggesting that you do that. Then there's, you know, the most important point, which is price, but that's up to you. Now, once you select a processor, it's the worst time. Grab a cup of coffee and get ready to lose a few nights sleep because this is the most annoying part of any build. The motherboard is, as I said earlier, the biggest challenge. So I'm gonna show you a real world example of the last time I built a home server in 2021 and why I ended up using an ASRock X570 Tai Chi and a Ryzen 5900X that I got as a bundle from Micro Center. But more importantly, why I bought it over another B550 ASRock motherboard that was cheaper at the time. Before we do, the first thing you need to look into is ECC memory. ECC memory is error correcting and non-ECC memory isn't. Most modern CPUs support ECC memory, but they require a compatible motherboard. If you don't want or need ECC memory, skip this part. But if you do, check first from the motherboards that support ECC memory because a lot of them don't. So you're narrowing your potential pool by a lot right off the bat. So back to the example, when you look at the X570 and B550 motherboards, they look the exact same. They function entirely differently, but they look the exact same. From an NVMe drive perspective, the X570 Tai Chi has three total M.2 NVMe slots, and they all run at Gen 4x4, but the B550 only has two M.2 slots, and one runs at Gen 4x4, but the other runs at Gen 3x4, so one less drive and slower speeds on the second NVMe drive for the B550. Then there are the PCIe slots. They look the same, meaning they have three full PCIe slots, but the lanes are split up totally differently. Using my Ryzen 5900X CPU as an example, the X570 has the fifth PCIe slot set as PCI Express 4x16, and that won't change since it uses the X570 chipset for its PCIe lanes. So yes, motherboards can have chipsets to add more PCIe lanes than a CPU supports. But on that X570 device, the first and third PCIe slots use PCIe lanes from the CPU, which are generally faster than the lanes from the motherboard chipset. You can use one PCIe 4x16 card or two PCIe 4x8 cards. So there are a maximum of 16 total lanes for the first and third slot, not 32. They both support PCIe 4x16, but not at the same time. So to summarize, if you fill all three PCIe slots, you'll have three cards running at PCIe 4x8, 4x8, and 4x16. Now compare that to the B550 and it's totally different. And keep in mind, they look the exact same on the surface. Using the same processor, the B550 can have one PCIe Gen 4x16 card, two PCIe 4x8 cards, or three PCIe 4x8, 4x8, and 3x4 cards. Then if you fill either PCIe 3x1 slot, the fifth slot gets downgraded to PCIe Gen 3x2. Now, none of this matters if you only need one PCIe slot, but for a home server, you'll probably need more. Common examples are for things like 10 gig networking, possibly a GPU for transcoding, maybe a SAS card if you're building a NAS, maybe you need more SATA ports, but what about if you just want more NVMe slots? NVMe drives use a maximum of four PCIe lanes, but as you saw above, these devices only support two or three NVMe drives, so what if you want more? You can buy a PCIe adapter to add another NVMe slot, but you might be filling a slot that has eight or 16 lanes with a device that only uses four. That would be a waste of PCIe lanes, so what do you do? Well, you could just take the hit if you don't need the extra lanes, or you could look into a motherboard that supports PCIe bifurcation. That is a very complicated way of saying that we're gonna split the 16 PCIe lanes. Most motherboards that support PCIe bifurcation, and remember, not all do, but the ones that do, generally allow three modes, eight by eight, eight by four by four, and four by four by four by four. That means you can realistically take one PCIe slot that has 16 lanes and run four NVMe drives at full speed off of it if it supports bifurcation. Each PCIe device that you purchase has a different number of PCIe lanes that it needs. So again, look at what you need, the total number of lanes the PCIe card needs, and then figure out the best configuration. You can still use cards that need eight lanes in a slot that only provides four, but remember, it will run at half the speed. 
To complicate all of this even further, there are motherboards that will disable certain PCIe slots if you use a different portion of the motherboard. For example, adding a second M.2 NVMe drive could disable the second PCIe slot. So get comfortable with the documentation on the vendor's website for the motherboard and make sure you understand exactly what configurations you can and can't do before making a purchase. And don't trust a retailer's website. Use the manufacturer's site to view the specs. Now there's memory, and I'll try and keep it brief. This is probably the final annoying part of any build, and it's how the memory is utilized mainly speed at which it can run. A motherboard with four DIMMs for memory doesn't mean you can run four RAM sticks at full speed. You'll be able to run one or two at full speed, but check the motherboard requirements because if you plan on filling it up, you might find that it runs at a slower speed with four than it does with two. So buying very fast memory might be a waste of money. To complicate it even further, what is displayed on the website isn't even accurate all the time mainly because memory can be overclocked. And some of these motherboards overclock memory by default. So while this X570 motherboard shows that I can only run four sticks at a max speed of 2667 megahertz, I've been running four at 3200 megahertz for three years. I don't know how you can take that into consideration when the documentation doesn't even say it's possible, but there's the icing on the cake to highlight how terrible this step is. For the rest of the motherboard, it's kind of up to your requirements. You can check the total number of SATA ports, the type of networking it comes with, and start to make a decision on the entire package. It's not the easiest step, but if you figure out what you need for your PCIe cards, you can work your way backwards and select the right motherboard. This might surprise you because more expensive isn't necessarily needed, but in unique cases, that might be the path that you have to take. Then comes the funner part, which is the drives, power supply, memory, and case. The case is generally personal preference based on your requirements, but using something like a NAS as an example, I'll leave a link in the description to an article I did on my favorite NAS cases to give you some ideas. If it's not a NAS, or even if it is a NAS, use whatever you want as long as it supports the motherboard form factor that you purchased. The drives are based on how much storage you want, with the understanding that you should buy NVMe drives based on the generation that the motherboard supports. So if it's Gen 3, buy a Gen 3x4 drive. Gen 4 would be Gen 4x4. You can buy a newer drive and put it into a slot that only supports an older generation, but it won't run at full speed, so it's probably better to save the money, but it's up to you. The memory is based on what the motherboard supports. It'll be DDR4 or DDR5 with newer builds, and ECC or non-ECC is based on your requirements. The only thing I'd say is don't go crazy buying memory that is overclockable to the max. Just get some ugly non-RG memory that will be reliable and fast and save the money. Power supply, again, based on your build. For most, something like a five or 600 watt power supply will be fine, but look at your components, estimate their power consumption using one of the online calculators, and give yourself a little headroom. I'd suggest buying at least a good gold rated power supply because this is what powers your build, so I wouldn't skimp out on it. Then you can look into some of the PCIe cards you might need, as well as some other miscellaneous components like CPU coolers and stuff like that. Sincerely, spend the time needed on the motherboard because quite honestly, nothing else is as important, including the processor. If you get the motherboard wrong, you either won't be able to do what you think you'll be able to do with your build, you'll be using components in the wrong spot and have decreased performance, or pay for a better motherboard while you aren't actually utilizing any of the features. Like I said, I have a few example builds below in the description, and I'll leave an Amazon affiliate link that you can use to purchase your components if this video helped you and you'd like to support the channel. But buy the components where it's cheapest, not necessarily what helps me, but if those happen across and you wanna support me, thank you very much. I know this was a lot, so if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. But other than that, thank you for watching. I'll see you guys next time.